Well, warm welcome to everybody. Um, the fun thing about this afternoon is that we've got a, a, an unusually broad mix of people. So typically this would be a very student-dominated audience, but at the end of each uh, session and semester, and in this case, the end of the year, will include a broader set of the community. So we've got some startups here, we've got some alums, we've also got a number of the uh, grads who started businesses, and then we've got people from the community. So warm welcome to you all. Happy to be here, and I'm gonna skip through my own intro. Um, I do wanna just take a moment to say, why did we decide to bring Jim here? It's not just because he's a nice guy and he happens to be an extremely successful CEO. Uh, Jim and I have actually worked together for many years now. As um, you just heard, we've run for seven years what's become the largest uh, open source survey in the industry. And it was because when I first got into the venture world, I was just astounded to see that the VC business didn't understand the importance of open source. And in fact, they didn't think it was investable because they thought it was free. And so how could you make money out of that? And um, it felt like it was a crazy thing to me to not evangelize something that was a, a tidal wave at the time, as at least I saw it. And so we were lucky enough to start working with companies like Red Hat. And unusually for a, a giant at the time and very much the sort of uh, earliest player in the industry, Red Hat was quick to jump on board. And I was just delighted to get to know Jim in the process. He spent um, a significant amount of his personal energy uh, working with us, helping making sure that Rather than just talking about Red Hat, he evangelized the open source cause. So we really appreciate having you here, Jim, and thanks for joining us. It's, it's going to be a pleasure working with you. And then we wanted to have a broader panel discussion a little bit later on. So welcome to uh, both Acquia, Tom Wentworth, uh, Tim Yaton from Black Duck, and Jeffrey Hammond, who's going to moderate it uh, from uh, Forrester. So we're going to have a bit of fun later on. So to give you a quick overview of the agenda today, um, I'll cover the wrap up of the Startup Secrets classes. Now, uh, this is the cheat sheet version of what is literally probably some dozens of hours of, of classes. And so uh, if you're like me or you're the student who wanted the cliff notes, this is the cliff notes for the last uh, few sessions in the last few months. And I'll cover in about uh, 30 to 45 minutes what is, as I say, dozens of hours. So you'll get a sense of how thin my material is because I can cover it that quickly. Uh, and then we'll get onto the substance and we'll have uh, Jim come up and talk about Red Hat and share with you his insights into how he's building not just a business, but actually a whole innovation movement around open source. And that's actually the piece that's most exciting to me is that we used to talk about open source and think about it as commoditizing the old kinds of businesses. And really, it's become actually the basis on which much of the innovation in the industry is, is happening. And then I'll sit down with Jim. We'll have a uh, pseudo fireside. I always laugh at the idea that we have fireside chats. And we're in New England, we need a fire, but we don't have one. We'll just be sitting on these two stools here. And we'll have our chat to, to catch up on uh, where he's got to at, at this point. And then we'll spend some time um, after that, as I said, to have a, a, a bit of a networking break and then a, a panel to, to wrap things up, which will give you a sense of the sort of broader sense of what's going on in, in open source as a whole. So with that, um, let me jump right into Startup Secrets. Now, how many of you have been to a Startup Secrets class? So I, I have at least a sense of that. OK, so a good number of you. You poor things have come back for more. I don't understand that, how that happens. Um, well, I was happy to see today that 80% that of the audience actually is, uh, has never been to one of our events before today, which is actually great. So we typically have about, uh, well, it's usually standing room only um, at the, the classes, and it's a, it's a very um, hands-on class. So we, we do workshops. We also encourage a number of the students at Harvard who are forming ventures to actually uh, get mentorship beyond the classroom. And there's a significant amount of continuity for people who come through class to class. But the idea I just want to give you a sense of was as simple as this, which is that 30 plus years ago when I started out as an entrepreneur, I knew nothing. Uh, I still know nothing, except the only difference is I now know I know nothing. Uh, and I've realized that the older I get, the more I have to learn. And so what I wanted to do was to, to, to rewind the clock and say, what would I have loved to have known starting out 30 years ago when I started building my first businesses that would have hopefully helped me not make so many mistakes? And there, believe me, there were countless mistakes. Uh, and in particular, to get away from this fear of failure, which I think is something that a lot of entrepreneurs feel is a stigma associated with starting a company that they, they worry might get attached to them if they fail. Uh, and my story started out with uh, a great opportunity to build a business before I took any venture money that became a 20 plus million dollar business back in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. A very profitable, and then I raised a ton of money alongside my brother, had a lot of fun doing so, and then lost everything. So went through that you know, sort of success and failure loop and realized that, in fact, I'm now lucky to be able to say this to you. If I hadn't done that, as my father said to me at the time, I wouldn't have learned or known anything. Because the real learnings I had were actually in the failings. 
uh, and in the failures. And I think that a lot of entrepreneurs feel that that's something that they don't want to talk about. It's actually incredibly important to talk about it. So in my classes, I feature both my failures uh, as well as others. We try to bring out the importance of what that really is, which in my world is that there is no such thing as failure. There's only learning. So the Startup Secrets class was designed to try to bring up, uh, obviously, the opportunities for learning. Now, we have lots of success stories, and you'll hear a couple of those today, including some of the fastest growing companies in America today, which we're lucky enough to be involved with. So of course, that's the fun part to talk about. But it's a real class, and it's about trying to get beyond academia and get to the fundamentals. So I'm actually just the setup for people to tell the stories. So we'll cover some of those today. Here are the eight core modules of the classes as they started out. We expanded uh, two of them this year, which was uh, company formation. It turned out that we hear this single biggest issue for startups in the Boston region, I'm sure it's true elsewhere too, is hiring. Always hear it. I can't hire people fast enough. I'm having trouble with hiring. We've you know, let somebody go, et cetera. And so we really took that to heart, and we actually expanded it, broke it out into its own module this year. And we had a workshop where we actually had people interviewing and so forth. And it turned out to be quite interesting because one of the things that people assume is that hiring is easy, uh, at least the interviewing process, for example, and the process of attracting people. And of course, it's not. And not only that, but it's highly impactful. So that's why we broke that out. Now, next year, um, we've had requests to break out a second of the, the topic. So we're, we're introducing go-to-market in two pieces. Uh, go-to-market turns out to be so critical. As you all know, once you build something, taking it to market and getting people to actually buy it is a lot harder than it seems. And if you look at the P&L of most um, steady-state companies, that's where all the, the money is. It's typically three times the R&D line item. And most people in the startup world don't think that. They think, oh, it's all about development. We build something brilliant. Everybody's going to beat a path to our door. So we, we've broken it out into two pieces. We cover in things like strategy, critical areas like branding. Uh, and in tactics, we talk about critical things like, for example, how do you decide whether you go direct or indirect? What are some of the models you might use? How do you engage things like OEM and so forth? And then um, a very interesting new class that uh, came out of spending a bunch of time as a mentor is, have I got what it takes? In other words, do you know if you're really an entrepreneur and have you got what it takes to go and build one of these businesses, which typically takes several years? And so understanding that up front, we thought might be quite helpful. And what we have there, again, is an opportunity to listen to some really experienced entrepreneurs. Uh, in fact, the first couple that come up will both have built billion-dollar-plus businesses. Um, and so there will be a, a great opportunity for people to hear how they did that from scratch. And that will be the first class that we kick off uh, 2014 with. So quite an extensive set of workshops. But we start off with something extremely simple. And in fact, this was my MVP, for those of you who like to use that uh, expression which was I wanted to give people one overview from top to bottom of what it would take to pitch your business. And if you could get it right, how would you make sure that the audience really received your message? So there are thousands of classes on how to do a great pitch. This is not about that. It's called getting behind the perfect pitch. And so what we try to do is to make sure that people understand what is, for example, the VC looking for when they ask you to present the team. What are they looking for when they hear you talk about your product? Do they want to hear all the features about it, or what are they actually trying to relate to? And so we get behind the perfect pitch, and I simplify it by talking about it as a story, because in the end, like everything, if people don't hear a story, they can't thread it, and they don't remember it. So we start off by telling a story, and in my case, I don't have a story to tell because I'm not pitching anything, uh, but I take the students through a walkthrough of actually my uh, travels along the Great Wall of China, which. Um, for those of you who've been in the class, you'll know I get horribly lost and uh, end up having to spend all sorts of uh, time both backtracking and finding my way through things, which I think is highly appropriate because it's actually true of many of the, the pivots and meanderings and challenges that we go through as startups. But what we talk about, which is very interesting, is what becomes um, clear after teaching this class you know, many, many times, and actually all over the world too, is that there's a big balance that entrepreneurs struggle with, which is vision and execution. Of course, if you walk in and you say, I've got an incredible vision to build a very big business and I'm going to take over the mobile applications world, just to you know, pick an example. People get excited about that, but then they say, well, where do you start? Because if you're trying to do all that and you're going to boil the ocean from day one, that's not going to be successful. So they want to know where you're going to start, and that's the execution piece, and they want to know that it's really focused. So there's a lot of talk about how do we balance that, and we spend a bunch of trying, trying to get the students to understand the significance of having both of those but not giving up on either one as they define a roadmap in between. But in the end, what I hope to do is, is get each of you, and for those of you who are students and founders, and there are a number of you I know in the audience, to find your own story and to tell it authentically. Because in the end, that's what matters. It's not what we say or what 
we want to hear. It's what you actually have to say that specifically is built on your unique experiences. And that is really the essence of a great pitch. Now, it's been important for us to, to make this community um, wide and not just you know, limited to Harvard and MIT and many of the other places that we have uh, founders from. So I'm really uh, delighted and thankful to the Mass TLC uh, and to Mark Lorian in particular from one of our companies, Aperion, who took the time to actually create a whole new uh, event in Boston called Boston Tech Jam this year and was delighted to support that. We actually had uh, literally dozens and dozens of entrants coming to create their own um, you know, pitches and also to get their startup you know, the attention it deserved to get underway. And so Boston Tech Jam happened the first time this year. We ran the class for them, got tremendous feedback for them, and there were a number of winners out of it who've, um, who've gone on to do great things, including getting funded. So by, by showing you this photograph, I also have a call to action for each of you, which is, could you please help for the entrepreneurs that aren't in this room and the people you know would like to get some exposure, that need the help, take a little bit of time to mentor them, find them the hook to where they can get some of this. Um, kind of uh, information and, and learning. And I will offer to do exactly what I did for Tech Jam, and I've done it many other places, which is to put on free classes when we can get a meaningful enough group. So um, I'm happy to do that. That's part of uh, this program. It's not supposed to be limited entirely to Harvard. We really do want to do this on a broader community basis. And I think there'll be many other events like Tech Jam that come out of this. So thanks to those who put it on. Now, one of the things that's so interesting about uh, talking with entrepreneurs is that they assume that they have to have all the answers. And in reality, when we talk to entrepreneurs at an early stage, they're usually missing many, many, many things. Very rarely do they have a complete team. Uh, they might be missing things like their value proposition. Very few of them have built a product. Some of them have, because these days it's cheaper on things like Amazon to do that. But even if they have, it's difficult for them to know how they're going to take it to market and put all of that into a business plan with a business model that makes sense. Well, I'm here to tell you that the most important thing I tell students is that we don't care, actually. Um, we do care about finding at least one or two attributes that really stand out. Covering all the bases does not make a great business. So just because you've got a complete team and you've built your product and you've got all your business plan and everything else does not mean it's going to be great. In fact, in many instances, the very best companies come in and they have something absolutely unique. For example, it might be an entrepreneur who has spent his 10,000 hours, if you've read those books, or his life or whatever it is, understanding, or her life, understanding what the particular problem is that they can solve uniquely well. And that might be all you need if you know that that problem is actually big enough to build a business around. We can help build the teams and work on the business models and figure out how to take them to market, et cetera. And in fact, many of the best companies that we bring to the iLab to showcase have done exactly that. They've come in with a guy, guy or a gal and an idea, and we've built the business around them. So uh, one of the things that uh, I've tried to do is help people to actually ask the right questions, not just uh, of themselves, but of course of others to get the mentorship. And having the right questions, we think, is much more important in many instances than having the, the right answers. And in particular, having the self-awareness and indeed the comfort to say, look, I don't know and I need help with is really a substantive part of what we're trying to expose. So um, people have asked me to write about this more. I, I find it whenever I, I get asked this is the biggest challenge is time, but I am doing more of that. You can find some of these things, like that particular article is up on LinkedIn. Uh, so you can find it on my site or on LinkedIn, and I'm also trying to engage in the conversation. So please feel free to, uh, you know, to bring up your questions as you have them. The second key class that we get into is building a, a compelling value proposition. And the reason that we focus on this is because what we see many times is that entrepreneurs come in with a great idea. Well, an idea is obviously important, but it's not the starting point. Why is the idea not the starting point? Well, that's a hard concept to, to get people to come up to, to grips with. So what I try to do is to take people back to this notion of where does an idea fit in the process of building your uh, business. And certainly it's important, and you can see it's right at the front of the diagram here, but a free-floating idea without any understanding of what it might be applied to or what opportunity it's addressing or what problem or need it's meeting is really pretty hard to invest in. In fact, I'd say nigh on impossible unless you happen to be somebody who already has the vision for what to do with it. But of course, we're not the entrepreneurs, so we're looking to help entrepreneurs understand what to do with their ideas. And that's where we get into defining the problems and solutions. And I'm going to bring this to life today uh, by sharing with you a case study from one of our own uh, investments, which is um, Actifio. And for those of you who don't know Actifio, this falls into the category of a company that was started with Ash, a great founder, um, who had an idea. And by the way, we spent a number of hours 
Uh, I'm lucky enough to have a great partner, Jamie Goldstein, who worked with him. Um, and Jamie and, and Ash and I would joke about the fact that the idea was fantastic. We both knew it was, but we couldn't invest in it until we could actually write the story and we could actually describe what kind of problem it really solved. Uh, and so here's a little bit of Ash talking about how he actually began to address that uh, initial problem, um, sorry, idea to problem stage of the business. Over the last, I would say, five, 10 years, and this is in 2008 now, uh, we saw a big change in, I think, some of the stuff you're talking about, big change in how IT is delivered. We saw a big change in how people use computing resources. And with the emergence of uh, models like the SaaS models, this whole notion of how consumers consume and the death of the box, basically. Uh, the whole idea of uh, a box <coughs> being something that you, you consumed, you bought, slowly became as old as uh, the mainframe business. So we looked at those three big paradigms and found an opportunity to come back and create uh, a disruptive environment where we decouple uh, what you do with your data versus where you store it. The old model was there was a box, it came with a few knobs, and if you wanted more of those knobs, you found more boxes. And that's, that's the way the business ran. And I think you know, your Microsoft Office example is a perfect one. There was no shared model, there was no ability to separate out uh, what I really paid for from a value perspective versus you know, the junk that has to come with the value. And so that was the basis for how we came back and tried to come, back, come up with a, a model that, that separated out what was truly important for the business from what was truly a commodity and come up with this unified uh, data management model. So I think that was, that was the starting point for the discussion. So uh, those of you who know the storage world might find that you know, reasonably easy to follow along. And if you don't know the storage world, you'd find that really hard to follow along. You wouldn't know why was it important to store, store data one way and not another way, and you'd probably struggle to understand why would it be important to have a unified data storage model. All those things were challenging. And interestingly enough, Ash himself, even though he was an extraordinarily successful CTO uh, at HP and had already had a successful exit with us at AppIQ, also struggled to get people to understand the significance of what he was doing. In fact, he got claimed a couple of times to be boiling the ocean himself because he had such a big vision, uh, which was to literally unify all the data storage that had ever been, you know, heretofore imagined across all kinds of different use cases. So we tell the story of how Ash actually takes that forward and we do it as a basis to actually get people to understand how do you get beyond the idea. And the first step we take is we try to get people to uh, define their problem in terms of four U's. What is it about the problem that is unworkable? Why is storage becoming unworkable? And it turns out there's some very good reasons for that. What was unavoidable about it? In other words, why is this a problem that you just can't get around? Death and taxes are unavoidable. But there actually turns out a bunch of other problems that are unavoidable too, whether it's compliance or in, in many instances regulation, et cetera. Then what is it that is urgent about this? Why as a startup are you gonna get into the top one, two or three priorities that somebody's gonna spend money on? And even though many startups will say they don't have any competition, we all know they have competition for time and money and, and attention if nothing else. And then finally, what is it about this market that's underserved and that gives you a basis to actually create a bigger company than just you know, the idea in your own backyard? So this is an example of one of the frameworks we use. I'm not um, going to do anything other than tell you the obvious here, which is it's not designed to be an answer. It's designed to get you as entrepreneurs to think about what are the things that you could do to define your idea in terms of for use. Uh, and by the way, if it's not a B2B problem such as storage is, we also have a framework for consumers as well, that because in many instances they don't think about things in these terms, but they have latent and aspirational needs, and, and we try to figure out how could you get to those and, and open up what might be opportunities for the next Facebook or Twitter or, or whatever that might be. But the interesting thing about this is that uh, as we tell the story, we introduce, uh, in this case, Mike Triana, who's the CMO at Actifio, and he will give you a sense of now how in the storage world it might actually be interesting to see uh, why there are in fact some real needs that can be addressed. You know, I think that we did a pretty good job against the four U's, right, in terms of our value proposition. Um, there was really no way to solve this complexity problem with current technology, right? Cur current technology had evolved incrementally from the technology that preceded it because that's what, uh, that's in the interest of the status quo. Um, every uh, enterprise uh, with data to be accessed and protected had this problem because they had all these little issues to be dealt with, so it was, it was absolutely unavoidable. Um, it was urgent because what happened over time as data moved from you know, megabyte to terabyte to now petabyte scale, 
companies were finding that more and more of their IT budgets were being consumed by checks they had to write to EMC for more and more spinning disk to store their crap. Um, it was like the enterprise equivalent of like those like, you know, places where you store your stuff, you know. Um, just imagine if you were paying more for that than you were for your rent. That was happening in the, that's what was happening in the ID department. So there was great urgency to try and liberate resources from these more mundane storage capabilities and apply them against more strategic IT objectives. And then finally, um, the market was underserved, uh, primarily because the big vendors all had a very concrete disincentive to tackle this problem in the way that served the customer. Um, you know, in the end, you know, the big companies were just buying more and more of these little, like, you know, uh, these little application companies, uh, these little uh, uh, um, organizations and compiling them into these more and more complex um, iterative things. And with that complexity came the opportunity for services revenue and everything was great. But this was the problem state. So what happens in the class is quite fun. We then go from even that abstract and we say, okay, let's get specific about what kinds of problems really turned out to be so painful they, were, they became unavoidable for people to address. And uh, Mike shares, uh, and so does Ash, that we don't know this, but when you store something on your file server at work, just a you know, Word document or a video if it's more complex, it gets replicated on average 12 to 16 times all around the backup, the disaster recovery, and then the co-location, and I could go on and on and on. To the point where over half the dollars spent on storage are actually on what they now call copy data. So it's data that's actually not used in production for transactions with your customers or anything else. It's just storing all the, as he put it, de delectably, crap that we can't actually use uh, day to day until, of course, something you know, comes up where we need it. So it's a, it's a real problem, and it costs the industry, as it turns out, billions of dollars, and they have a real solution to it. So what's fun is, obviously, to think about, well, what's the way in which you could break that old paradigm? And we spent a bunch of time talking about how really big opportunities are, in many instances, breaking something. The, the word breakthrough has break in it for a reason. You, you're looking for what we call 3Ds, discontinuous innovation, something that fundamentally changes the game, a defensible technology obviously something that when you build it has real IP in it, and then ultimately something ideally that also has a disruptive business model so that it's hard for people to follow and it can take the existing giants, the legacy players like an EMC or an HP, uh, years to catch up with it because they can't afford to give up on it. And you heard uh, a little bit of this from Mike at the end where he was talking about how the existing vendors in storage make a fortune out of copy data because they sell boxes for doing nothing other than dedupe or nothing other than disaster recovery or nothing other than backup. So it serves them to continue to do that. So it's very disruptive for somebody like Actifio to come along and say, you don't need any of that. We're gonna actually just sell you one unified data service and you'll get all the same value out of it. The net result, by the way, is that Actifio is the fastest growing storage company ever. Because guess what? These are really impactful things when you solve them. So let's hear a little bit about that. Uh, from uh, Mike, because he gives you the, uh, the wrap up here. So discontinuous innovation uh, really starts with the courage to break with the past. Um, and I talked earlier about some of the themes that Ash just uh, reiterated, which was uh, changes in the enabling technologies of storage and a customer affinity for these single function boxes and applications. Um, and I think early in the company's life, uh, Ash and David really made a decision that we're gonna start with something uh, totally new, start with a blank sheet of paper. Uh, the cliche is actually true in our case, that's what they started with. Um, that led to the development of some defensible technology. So it started off with the architecture, a new way of solving the problem. Uh, we've invested a lot of time and, and other people's money um, in building up now a portfolio of 22 patents you know, in process, filed or pending, uh, in order to make this original idea real. Right? There was a whole bunch of enabling stuff that needed to happen for us to uh, realize that original vision that happened on a you know, yellow line piece of paper. Um, and then what's come last was a, a way to sell that and price it in a way that is very difficult for our already public scaled competition to match. It would involve complex restatement of the way they do their financials and, and alter their cash flow model in a way that would make investors uh, unhappy. So, so for us, I think it's, it starts with that break. It starts with a better way. And I think after, after finding that, it's, it's years of work
to go and do everything necessary to realize the vision on that piece of paper. So at this point, you must be thinking, fantastic, they've got this breakthrough, they've figured out how they can save the customers an absolute fortune, and why isn't this just going to be incredibly successful? I've already told you it is, so why would we even bother with any part of the class at that point? Well, it turns out there's an incredibly important piece we always miss, and it's what I call the gain-pain ratio. So I'm not going to take you through that entire class. This is about highlights. You can find all this on the site, of course. But there's one little detail that most startups miss, which is what does it actually take for you to get adopted? So let's say I said to you, well, we're going to take all your production data offline to install Actifio. How effective do you really think that would be? Not very, obviously. People can't do that. And that's the, the uh, pain associated with see, try, buy your software or, or solution. And it's very rarely something that the entrepreneurs spend enough time on. And they also forget this middle thing, which is that by default, because they don't carry an HP card or an EMC card, they are kind of going to come up against enormous inertia just because of the risk associated with working with them. So in fact, what we talk about is how critical it is that even if you've got a fantastic gain, you're measuring it against the pain of adoption and the reality of the inertia and risk of being a startup and that you actually have to get to at least an order of magnitude improvement on your gain-pain ratio. So Ash, of course, is going to summarize for you and tell you uh, that they actually did do that. On an average, we're 30 to 1. We just, like I said, I just came back from this where we're 34 million versus 1.2. <laughs> um, you know, recovery is, um, you know, eight and a half hours versus two minutes. Just a whole different ball game. So I will tell you what, what we concluded out of that, which is important, was that the actual initial implementation for Actifio was really holding us back. And um, I happen to be, you know, have been on many of their board meetings in the early days, so I can tell you this. The team had all this incredible technology, but packaging it originally was incredibly hard. In fact, we had to go back and package an entire end-to-end -end appliance system before people started consuming it. Initially, we thought we'd just sell it as software. It just doesn't work that way, because then people have to configure it themselves, figure out how it's going to fit with all of their existing things. And it was only when we really spent time looking at the gain-pain ratio and figured out how to take the pain away that the business started to take off. And of course, that's a, a, an incredible credit to the team that they did it so well that it's taken off and become so fast growing. So that's the first workshop. And I just summarized for you two hours in, in about 15, 20 minutes, so probably did a pretty poor job of it. But you can find the full detail of it on the site. And the important thing I want to highlight to you here is that the workshop's irrelevant without the case example. Uh, Actifio brings it to life. We have many of these case examples, and many of the companies from both the community locally and further afield have contributed to this. And if you have a case example that you think would bring how you develop a value proposition to life, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to have you, you know, included in the, in the workshops going forward. Okay, so the second workshop, as I said, started to tackle this issue of how do you start a company and what's important in that early stage? And it hits right on the first thing that most people skip over, culture. And why do people skip over it? Because guess what? You can, you can easily forget it. You don't think about culture every day. You typically think about, oh, how do I just get on and build my product, hire some people to do that? But if you look at the most successful companies in the world, and I'll give you some of the stats from the class, they are on average three times more successful when they've got a culture that is considered great to work for. That's not my data. That's consistent when you look at data from the records of companies that do these, uh, from uh, periodicals that do these surveys like Forbes and Fortune and so forth. So this really makes an impact. Culture is literally hitting the top and bottom lines for companies. But we also know in the startup world that it's a critical part of what enables companies to take their value proposition, hire the right people, execute, and go after their vision and mission. And the one piece that typically people forget is how important this is as a foundational element. After all, if you don't have a culture that actually establishes what kind of people you want to hire, how do you choose what the first people are you go and, go and recruit? But people skip this step. So we pay attention to it, and we try to bring out some of the fundamental elements that are often lost again uh, because they're just taken for granted, which is that for entrepreneurs, the culture comes directly from them. And even at the largest of companies in the world, you'll find the culture comes from the top. It's been written about in many different forms. So why not? in the, the future generation of great companies that we'll hopefully build in this region, why not start right, day, right from day one helping founders understand how to model it and how to be consistent about it? Because the real strength in culture is actually about establishing its consistency and keeping that from day one. So to bring that to life, we uh, brought in one of our uh, most recent investments, actually, um, who also talked about how important it was and pointed out uh, that the vision and mission in a company, and in their case, uh, very critically, 
uh, at the earliest stages was, was also crucial to hiring people because people aren't going to just join a culture because it was fun to work there. They wanted to really make a difference. And in fact, for the millennial diff uh, generation, we have seen many, many times that the least important thing is the salary you pay them. The most important thing is that they feel that their work is genuinely impactful. And so they want to know that that vision and mission is significant. So we, we talk about a lot of case examples from things as recent as Twitter and how Twitter evolved its vision and mission. And actually, when Dick Costello came on, he talked about what the impact was of Twitter as opposed to just, you know, it was just a great way to send out you know, 140 characters across the web. Um, and then we bring it to life with, as usual, I say, case studies. So I'm going to introduce to you Jason Purcell here. He's the uh, co-founder in this incarnation of Salsify, a company we just backed this year. And uh, before that, he was a founder, a founding member of the team at Indeca. For those of you who know that story, it became about a $100 million plus business with about a billion dollar outcome. And Jason built the commerce business for it. So he has a right to an opinion in this space. He's actually, I would say, uniquely qualified to understand the problem he's going to address, which is actually critical. And he described it in the early days to us as, it's all the information that makes commerce possible. Because if you can't get the product information to sell things online, then you have no basis to sell anything. And yet that information is so fragmented, and it's in so many different places around the world, and it needs to be brought online into things like catalogs and distributed out to retailers and to different countries, et cetera, and kept up to date. And it's not up to date today because it's not available in a form that's, for example, distributed and on the cloud. So Salsify enabled, um, enables that, but his, he, he'll, you'll hear from him. He wanted to establish a broader vision than that. We looked at this problem and said there ought to be a way to um, really create a, a network of product information that brands can publish out and retailers and, and users, application authors, can subscribe to and consume product content. And so we said that's what we wanted to do. It's a big network that we want to create. It's a long-term play. It's something that's going to take a very long time to deliver. But we, we knew that even though we were going to start with a small process, we wanted to have that unifying us. And having that, that concept, even though it's not necessarily what the engineers are building every day, it's not necessarily what we're selling from a beachhead perspective every day, having that is incredibly helpful when we're you know, pitching candidates, when we're just internally prioritizing what we're going to do and, and talking to other folks. Now, Jason then hit on something that I mentioned a little earlier. He said it was great having the vision, but of course, he needed to start with some very clear execution about what was the first product he would build, how would he get it to market. And so he needed, between the, the uh, vision and execution, a roadmap. And a lot of the students would say to me things like, well, why is a roadmap important? I mean, I, I hear that you as an investor might want it, but does it really have any practical value? So we challenged Jason to talk about where was the roadmap used. And it turns out he wouldn't have got his first customer, which was a six-figure customer, and a very significant uh, retailer, too, if it weren't for his roadmap. And so here's a story of how he did that. And, and actually having the roadmap, not the product roadmap, but the company roadmap, when we ended up doing the, the demonstration and talking to the VP of e-commerce, and this overcame so many product objections. I mean, there was just, a, it created so much credibility with the guy where he was like, you know what, I, I love where they're going. It's aligned with where I want to go. I'm glad you have that, and I'm willing to bet, you know, not a ton of money, but I'm willing to bet a, a little bit on you guys to, to see where you're going to go. And that was how we landed one of our first few customers. And, you know, if it was just, if we didn't have that, that roadmap, again, it's not really a product roadmap. It's more just a, a vision. Uh, I don't think we ever would have gotten them, and, and it's helped us to this point. So there you are in eight minutes, a quick summary of, again, a couple of hours workshop on why we think culture, vision, and mission are important. And of course, we go into a lot more detail than that with some of the case examples. And then on to the next workshop, which is um, the one that we broke out this year on hiring. And as I mentioned to you earlier, this is obviously a significant problem for people. And so I decided I, bet I need to get somebody in who really had experience of this at enough depth. And we brought Russ Campanello, who happens to have been somebody who's worked with my partner, Rich, at Phase Forward, and then went on to do phenomenal things at Oracle after being acquired there. Uh, and is now at iRobot. But for those of you who know Russ or don't know him for that matter, um, he's been a multi-time successful head of HR and become very strategically involved in the companies and really thinks about talent in that way. And Russ added tremendous value, uh, starting with bridging from culture uh, right through to you know, the importance of it in hiring. So I'll let him introduce this. But everybody is an extension of the brand that you're trying to build. You have a brand yourself. You have a set of values and a set of passions. Those have to be expressed through everybody you're building. The, most, the, the single most important person in the development of the culture, you learned this work last week, I'm sure, is the leader. Right? And, that, and as a startup, the value, I said about it earlier, the value you're generating includes 
the relational equi the equity value, the emotional intelligence of the people that you have on your team, and the relationships that they build and the relationships that they have. So there you are. You've got a little sneak preview of some of the things we bring out in culture around values and principles and why they're more important than rules and regulations in establishing your early culture. And then we get into the essence of what everybody's always after, which is how do I make a great hire? And everybody's always after A hires, A plus hires and sometimes. Uh, and so we get to the, the heart of this and talk about three key things. Can you hire people who can be genuinely successful at the job? Will they really love it? And then will they fit and reinforce it? And to state the obvious, when people love what they do, they tend to take pride in their work and the results and the rewards all follow from it. But that is something we skip over so often. People go straight to, have you got C-sharp skills? No, wait a second, that's not good enough. I also want iOS skills. And do you understand how to do object-oriented? It's all great, but if they don't get along with your team and they've got no idea what you're building and don't care about it, I doubt they'll be successful. And it's amazing how many times that gets skipped over. So we break this into some specific um, attributes. We talk about how to get aptitude, ability, and um, the right attitude to engage in your team. And then we get into some of the tools uh, that, that will help people find out whether they're going to make a successful hire. And obviously, I'm not going to go through all of that today. But I'll give you a little bit of a sense of it again in, in Russ's words here. Every person you hire in a startup, from employee number two, three, four, and five, is an extension of you and what you're trying to accomplish. It's another asset that you bring to the equation. And if you have someone who's not aligned or who doesn't contribute to the EQ quotient in your organization, you're actually detracting value uh, from, from your organization, your ability to be successful. So what we talk about is some things that seem initially quite soft and then they become quite hard to people when, when you actually describe them. So for example, why is EQ important? Why does it matter that people have the ability to get, al get along with their, their coworkers? And in a startup, it turns out it's a critical thing because we do things like speed team in startups. People don't just have one job. They very quickly have to form into a new team around a customer problem that might come up or some way to deal with, for example, a partner that, that's got into a difficult relationship. And in order to be able to work effectively outside the organization, they need a high EQ. So in many ways, it turns out EQ is a very important factor in the early assessment of whether you're going to have a, uh, an employee that fits with you. Now, in order to make this practical, we actually started a workshop. and so. We had people interview each other. And of course, to do that, we had to start with some questions. And um, it turns out the most popular question was, was one that I've now asked for about 30 years in my career. And I still always ask this question. So if any of you ever get to come and have the displeasure of an interview with me, you'll know before you start, this is the question I'm going to ask you. The question is, why? Why do I ask you this question? Well, because if I don't know what you're passionate about and I don't know what you're interested in, I'm going to have a very hard time understanding how to fit you into my organization or into a team that I'm working with. Whereas by contrast, when we can find people who are really passionate for their reasons about what the company is trying to do, and for their reasons are going to be excited about making a contribution for whatever that vision and mission is, then for their reasons, they will continue to be energetic about it. And when they take the pride and, and uh, the results will follow, it will be both serving them and the company. And it's so obvious to state this, and yet again, this is a question that people usually don't ask. They usually spend all the time on, on things like skills and, and experience. And it turns out, Russ brings this out very well, when he was at Phase Forward, the domain expertise of what they were doing, which was clinical trials over the web, required a whole set of understanding about clinical trials. And then if you're going to be a programmer and you needed to understand web pro programming and three-tier uh, capabilities, that's another set of skills. And then if you needed to obviously fit the culture of the company, that's another set of attributes. Pretty soon you end up with a, a null set of potential people who really understand pharma extremely well, this particular set of programming paradigms, and are exact fits for your culture. So what do you do? Which one do you trade off on? And I'm not going to give you the answer. I'll let you go look at the workshop. But he has a pretty good explanation of it. But you can see that we, we try to emphasize some of the things that people think about. And this notion of passion is something that we bring to life with one of our companies that's here today, Acquia. Uh, and so here's a little bit of background from the CEO, Tom, to talk about that. And by the way, just like uh, Actifio, I, I said you would bring up some of the fastest growing companies. This is the fastest growing software company in America today and actually was uh, number one in the, in the uh, Forbes uh, list this year again. So that acronym is PIII. And it's something we look for in every candidate who is hired in the company and starts with passion, P for passion. And we want people who are really, you know, Love it. I, I had a conversation with one of our people on our engineering team last week, and I asked him, he's been with us a year, I said, how's work going? He said, work? I looked at him kind of funny, he said, yeah, work. He said, I don't work. He said, I come here because I love it. 
And uh, that's an important thing about passion. And, and uh, for the sake of time, I won't go through details on the other three, but they stand for, in order, intelligence, integrity, and initiative. And it's about intelligence, not raw intelligence, but you know, doing the right thing, doing the smart thing, using common sense. Integrity, because by all means, we need to do that with ourselves, with our peers, with our customers, and with our partners. And initiative, we want people who um, we have another saying for that, of course, which is uh, ask for forgiveness rather than permission. And we live that each and every day. So that's how we define culture. We use an acronym. It makes it easier. And, and we can talk about it as a company as a result. So. Just uh, felt like the right place, right time, amazing opportunity. I looked at the vision for Drupal and I said, this is the future. And, and I want to be part of that. So we're hiring like crazy. So what we went through there was quite fun. Uh, we talked about what does a culture look like? How do you actually understand whether a company has a culture that will fit you? And we even get to talking about physical manifestations of it. And again, I won't spoil the uh, opportunity for you to go and see photographs of how people actually show their culture physically. Uh, and it's everything from their office layouts to the mascots they use to the way in which they present themselves. And there's a very interesting story which we're going to bring out next year, which is a case study of a company that the CEO will tell you that uh, when he took over the company, the reason it was broken 100% was because of culture, nothing to do with the products or the potential in the marketplace. And it's a, it's a fantastic story, a success story of how somebody turned a business around entirely based on culture. And that's why we emphasize it in terms of cultural quality of fit. Now, I mentioned that people are always looking for the, the sort of plus. Uh, it's not just Google who's introduced this, but everyone's A plus hires. And so we talk a little bit about what well, some of the other attributes that people might look for. Uh, and here's uh, one of the things that, that we talk about, which is even if you can't find that perfect intersection, and you rarely will where you can get all the attributes that somebody's got, all the experience, all the knowledge, all the skills to line up, then at least find somebody who's got self-awareness, who's genuinely authentic and hopefully enough of an athlete that they can uh, adopt to the skills that you need. So here's Russ to talk a little bit about that. I think the other way to think about an athlete is as someone who's, who's proven that they've been successful at everything else that they've done. And they, were, and they may, be, it may not be the direct customer support person, but they've, they've moved up the sales channels, they've, uh, they've done another uh, set of work in another part of the organization that's been successful. And they've shown, I would think it was a combination between attitude and ability, and you, they, they're gonna be good at whatever they do. They're just gonna be able to move one degree left or right to be successful. So immediately after this workshop, I was bombarded by a bunch of entrepreneurs, a bunch of conversations online, where people said, this is great, it's very exciting, but I want to make it more practical. Uh, I want to know the questions that you ask. And so we created a slideshow that you can find on the site, uh, which has all of the favorite hiring questions. And I didn't just take them from me. I went and spent a bunch of time with, with HR professionals in, in the startup world, as well as just the CEOs and founders who've got their own way of doing this. And then we co-authored an article, which is up on LinkedIn, and uh, a series of pieces on how do you hire. And in fact, we've come up with an ideal uh, and I would say it's ideal because it isn't proven yet, but uh, Russ is trying to put it into practice already, which is to flip hiring entirely on its head. Uh, at the moment, we tend to reach out and hire people and try to you know, push our message out there to, to say, we want to you know, interview you and so forth. But just like in inbound marketing has taken a, a big piece of what used to be considered the outbound marketing world, I've come up with this idea of inbound recruiting. And so you'll find a piece up on LinkedIn on that. And the idea is that, again, if you can really espouse what it is that your company represents in terms of its culture and the kinds of people that you're looking to hire, then why not include that in everything that you do so that people are attracted to come and work with you? And it turns out some of the best recruits I ever made in my career were actually customers or, or partners, for example, who, for their reasons, saw the problem, understood why you were a uniquely valuable company. And therefore, when they joined, had the right basis on which to be evangelists or successful and obviously in, in carrying your message forward. So you'll find those articles up there. And again, uh, for those of you who want to contribute to this, you know, the site is designed to be very much open source in that sense. And we'd love to have you in the classes in next year's workshops or contribute. So on to the last class for this semester and the one that sets up for Jim, and, and that's around business models. And a lot of people think this is, again, something you, you do sort of later down the road when you're starting to make money. The problem with that is that it turns out many of the things you do early on, even in the way you design your product, actually cause your business model to to fall out one way or another. For example, if you build your product entirely as a monolithic, one-off packaged item, it's going to be very hard for you to do things like OEM deals because you won't have anything to upsell. So thinking about things like that is really critical early on. 
And so what we do is we try to dissemble this notion and get people to think about how will their business model be at least as disruptive as their product or technology. Because in many instances, some of the best and most brilliant companies that, have, that are building value out there today are actually not inventing technology. Um, in many instances, actually what they're doing is they're building a different business model to rewrite the rules and change the game of, of how the value is delivered. And so open source is a, is a wonderful example of that, and we'll hear about that later on. But we also talk about the sort of broader picture of this in terms of how, for example, when you build a product, if you enable, for example, others to create on top of it, you eat your own cooking, or uh, in some cases it's called dog fooding, it's, it's a popular term, uh, enable people to build on your APIs, for example, you create tremendous value. And if you don't believe me, there were two companies last year that were sold entirely based on their, their value of, of managing APIs, Mashery, I uh, was one, for example, a couple of hundred million dollars worth of, of exits here because this is becoming the new world. People are expecting to be able to build things on top of each other, mash up, for example, different cloud services and deliver business processes. So there's tremendous opportunity for this, but it also turns out it's a very effective way for you not to have to build an entire value chain. You can pick off what it is you, you do uniquely well, what we call the core value, and then enable others to build around that. And then, of course, um, I was lucky enough at this time last year to have Andrew Jassy up as our special guest who started uh, with his team, the Amazon Web Services Movement that's now become a multi-billion dollar movement inside of Amazon. And we bring this up as an example of an entire business that got started because somebody started this way. Because Amazon, as we know, did not start as a cloud service. So here's Amazon's uh, story and Andy's, a small part of the interview with Andy around how did he actually use co-creation to build a business. And one of the tests they tried was they just took all the product data, the you know, the product title, the pricing, the availability, yep. et cetera. They put all that in, a, in an API, and they thought if they could decouple the data from the presentation, that associates would do more with the data than we had time to or would think of. And that led to much better conversion for those that used it. But what really surprised us was with no promotion, thousands and thousands of de developers flocked to these APIs. And they used them for things we didn't necessarily anticipate them using them for. And they asked us to open up all kinds of parts of our platform that we hadn't really contemplated. And so all those things came together really in mid-2003. And we took this step back and we said, well, if you believe that developers and businesses will build applications from scratch on top of these web services, which people call the cloud now, um, then it, the operating system becomes the internet, which right. was a really different model than before. And then we said, well, okay, if, if you can believe there's going to be an internet operating system, what are the key components, what's been built, and what will we be good at contributing to? And when we looked at that in mid-2003, none of the key elements of that internet operating system had been built yet. And when we thought about what we were good at, and Amazon's always been a technology company at its heart, one that applied it to retail first, but always a technology company, we realized we could contribute many of those pieces of that internet operating system. And with that, we decided to pursue this much broader you know, mission, which was to enable developers and businesses to be able to use these web services to build any sophisticated, scalable application they wanted. So there is an example of an entire business, Amazon Web Services, that got started around somebody thinking a little bit out of the box about how to co-create and build value and create a disruptive business model. And although Amazon doesn't break it out, uh, I can tell you without breaking any confidence that it is a multi-billion dollar business that's driving today the biggest revolution in our world, which is cloud. And just think, if we get to understand how to approach these kinds of opportunities that way, then we hope the next generation of students will be doing exactly that from these classes. So we also obviously today are going to focus on open source. And to set that up, uh, I'm going to introduce another of our um, founders, Dries Botert, who actually founded uh, the Drupal project. And Drupal today is actually the largest single open source project on the planet. Uh, over a, uh, a million people contribute to the Drupal uh, organization. And there are literally tens of thousands of developers contributing to the project that is used for building websites that are called you know, socially aware today. So social publishing is the movement. And uh, Dries is the founder behind that. And let me give you his introduction to why he did this. Um, open source, uh, it's not just a license. It actually leads to collaboration, leads to this huge, huge community with thousands and thousands of people. And it's actually that community that translates into a lot of innovation. And then as a result, open source actually wins, or at least mature open source projects, they win not just because it's cheaper or less expensive, but it's actually better. 
and it's better because the fact so many people um, you know contribute to it and so uh, in terms of business models um, you know Drupal and open source in general um, they're a huge you know catalyst for uh, creative destruction I don't know how many people know uh, Schumpeter but uh, I was an economist that had this you know concept uh, concept of creative destruction which basically he said that um, you know to create more value and to you know to to change change the game you actually have to destroy something and so in in many ways what's happening here is we are kind of changing the way um, we develop software through open source we're changing the way people build websites I didn't really talk about that um, but the way we do things in Drupal is fundamentally different from um, the way our competitors work um, but in doing so, we're also changing our industry. The way we sell Drupal, the way we market Drupal, all of these things are being um, you know, disrupted. So the way I first come to came to meet Dries was quite interesting. I watched a lot of the open source projects because that was one of the theses you heard earlier that I really believed in when I joined the industry, the VC business. And I was shocked to see that he kept breaking talking about creative destruction, he kept breaking the architecture of Drupal from Drupal 2 to 3, from 4 to 5, for example, which is an extraordinary thing to do because most innovators get locked into their particular way of doing things and they end up with the innovator's dilemma, which we may all know is, is what caught out, for example, Microsoft when Google came along and started giving Office for free. But Dries didn't do that. And to this day, every time Drupal is going to go from one version to another, he looks at the very best architecture out there and says, we're going to adopt that. And we're going to bring the customers with us. They'll always find ways to do that. We'll enable them, for example, to keep all their content, all their websites. And these are some of the biggest websites in the world. Com companies like GE, for example, that rely on Drupal. But we're going to make sure they have the best, the latest technology. So he actually pra practices what he preaches when he talks about creative destruction, which is a hard thing to do. And it's a lesson I think we could all learn from. Now, in the class, we try to just keep it very simple. We, we talk about how do you make sure that you don't start by trying to do too many things? So instead of owning the entire value chain, which is very difficult for a startup to do because you always have limited resources, instead, what can you pick as your real core value and really focus on it? And then how could you either enable a community or a set of other players to build around that that would give them an ultimate value from working with you so that an end-to-end -end value gets built around you and your core differentiation stays that? And you are obviously able to leverage it when you go to market. So uh, of course, the best way to get anybody to focus on anything is through numbers. So we bring up the, the CFOs usually at this point. And this is Dennis, the CFO at Acquia, talking about the business model. Uh, we took Drupal, and we enable organizations to run Drupal at industrial strength. We do this, but we provide a cloud platform for them, to you know a platform for them to run the website. We provide tool, de developer tools. We provide um, uh, 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 software that, that you can add on to run on your website. We provide professional services such as training. We provide insights into what's going on on your website, et cetera. Uh, the result of which is if you're running a Drupal website, if you're a big organization running a Drupal website, uh, that website runs uh, much, much better on Acquia than it does on any other platform that you can run. So again, industrial strength support for Drupal is the, uh, is the business model we created. And so one of the things that's going to be interesting to hear from Jim is whether that's very much different than Red Hat. I suspect not, actually. But uh, this is the point, is that actually you don't need to build everything yourself. Uh, in fact, we don't even build any of the, the uh, core capabilities that were, um, you know, in many instances, used by some of our customers. But what we do do is obviously provide that kind of critical support. In the class, we bring out two concepts. One is multipliers, which are the things that actually increase your revenue, increase the lifetime, life cycle value of a customer, increase your reach, increase your coverage. And a lot of those are concepts that are not just about technology. It's about how do you, for example, get the right distribution from partners where your product might get embedded in their uh, go-to-market because of the value you bring to them. And then also, how do you take the costs down with levers like, for example, this co-creation where you're not developing everything. Uh, and you can therefore get much lower R&D to reach a much broader set of needs. What's fun about this is when you bring that, that to Drupal, again, you can just put it into some very specific um, case examples. It's really the community that does this for us. So the community, those 28,000 developers that we talked about, are constantly innovating the product that is Drupal. 
um, they are constantly making it better, again, in a scale that we cannot replicate as one organization. Um, more importantly, uh, they provide levers, and the levers happen in the sales model as well as in the development model. And we summarize by talking f about what makes a really great business model. And those of you who've heard me talk say what a horrible learner I was. And so I, I reduce everything to acronyms. Uh, and the, the acronym for this one is just simply RSVP. When you can find a business model that's truly repeatable, scalable, and valuable with multipliers, um, and then ultimately becomes predictable and, and eventually profitable, you have a real business model. And I always get challenged at this point because a lot of the audience, and it's great actually at, at Harvard, of course, not just smart, but from the community as a whole, um, is looking to do social good. And so a lot of social enterprise companies that are not for profit. So in the last year, we've taken that on board. We've done a number of case studies that are not for profit examples. And in the business model case, we talk about, well, it's still, even if you're not gonna get profitable, critical that it's sustainable. Uh, how do you do something that, that can endure even if it's not trying to make a profit? And so one of those case studies is uh, Diagnostics for All. And I'll let Jason Rowland explain to you how he does that. Academics are, are historically terrible at product development. Um, and there, there needs to exist an organization that sits in between the innovators and the commercial partners. And that's what we were, were formed to be, to take um, innovative ideas and concepts and tools and build products that address specific needs in the developing world. And then our job is to hand those off. And, and we hand those off to uh, commercial partners in country, so uh, diagnostic manufacturers in Africa. Um, but also we're recognizing that there's, there's money to be made um, with simple, easy to use technology here in the developed world. So we also can hand off and sub-license technology uh, to, to for-profit companies and gener generate revenue streams. Um, and so that's, that's our, our goal. So I think our, you know, our multiplier would be fundraising and our, our, um, our lever is getting those products out the door and creating, pro uh, creating customers that, that are actually using them. So with that, we uh, finished that segment and I, I want to thank all of the students and the people who contributed to the uh, the workshops that, that uh, we've just had. And for those of you who want to contribute to case studies, we have you know, many, many, many up there today. These are some of the most recent ones that, that have come up for supporting a lot of the evidence um, behind this. Uh, but we want to hear from you, and if you've got uh, particularly good ideas for case studies or want to participate in them, please uh, just send a note either directly to me or ej at northbridge.com uh, and let us what your ideas are for that.